I forgot to click it. I'll get told off. No prayer in the beginning. Um, if I use the word name Elizabeth this morning, I think one picture will come into your mind, or one person. Yes? I think for everybody, nearly around the world, as about half the world supposedly joined in and watched the royal funeral, or some of it on Monday. Um, I was glued from the TV from 10 to 9 French time till about quarter past whatever it was after they'd finished in Windsor with about an hour's break in between. Um, so I um, binged on TV, which is most unlikely because I hardly watch it at all. Uh, but what a day it was. One word, though, that has come out in the week, 10 days before, and came out on that funeral service more than once, so actually two words. One is the word humble, and I think all people are acknowledging what a humble lady she was. Okay, yes, she was very formal, she could stand on dignity, she could have a lot of fun, uh, pretending to jump out of helicopters in 2012 for the Olympic Games with James Bond. Um, which she didn't, but she was there in the opening sequence. And then to appear across Paddington Bear at the beginning of June, both of which events were apparently total surprises to the rest of the family. Nobody knew. So she liked to pull the wool over people's eyes. And the, uh, the grandchildren were sitting there watching on the second one going, Ganga! Ganga! And their eyes popping out. What a lady, what a lady, what a humble lady. But the other word was the word, anybody going to go for it? What's the other big word that's been used of Elizabeth? Faith. Yes, that has, very importantly, but I'm thinking of another word, servant. And a few years ago, at her 90th birthday, we had copies of the little booklet from her own words, the servant queen, because of course she has spoken so clearly of her faith in the king of kings and the king of queens. Um, what's in a name? There's a lot in a name, isn't there? But not perhaps as much today. Nicknames are probably more significant than sometimes our names. We're given names because our parents chose it. But in days gone by, often names were given with a significance, as I say, as they might be with nicknames today. And sadly, of course, some of the nicknames are not very kind. You've probably guessed, I wonder if anybody's guessed actually what passage I might be preaching on this morning. I'm not going to ask Nikki because I've already told her. It's Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Does that surprise you with the songs we've sung this morning? Uh, I hope not. Um, and at least two of them, if not more, have mentioned a key bit. Um, what should we do? Let's read verses... No, let's read it all in English and all in French this morning. Somebody to read in English, please. It's not a long passage. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who be in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. <clears throat> Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. En français, s'il te plaît. Que notre attitude soit identique à celle de Jésus-Christ, lui qui est de condition divine, Il n'a pas regardé son égalité avec Dieu comme un butin à préserver, mais il s'est dépouillé lui-même en prenant une condition de serviteur, en devenant semblable aux êtres humains, reconnu comme un saint homme, il s'est humilié lui-même en faisant preuve d'obéissance jusqu'à la mort, même la mort sur la croix. 
C'est aussi pourquoi Dieu l'a révélé à la plus haute place et lui a donné le nom qui est au-dessus de tout nom, afin qu'au nom de Jésus, chacun plie le genou dans le ciel, sur la terre et sous la terre. Et que toute langue reconnaisse que Jésus-Christ est le Seigneur à la gloire de Dieu le Père. The climax of this massive passage, a wonderful passage, is the declaration that Jesus is Lord. Uh, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes. The whole concept of Jesus as Lord, what it means. But what goes before it is so significant. And this passage has been considered by some to have been either some form of early Christian statement, we might call it a creed, or even something to sing. And certainly a lot of people have been singing these words in the centuries since. Um, and many of our modern songs, as we've been reminded this morning, echo this wonderful passage. But I've got three headings, it's me being quite good really, only three, uh, and an interest, a different sort of conclusion. Um, we have to wait for that, I'll hold you in bated breath. The first one, all the headings are very, very simple this morning. The first one is who Jesus is. And that is the first part of verse 6. Who being in very nature God. Who being in very nature God. Now the word that Paul uses for nature could also be translated form. <coughs> In Greek, it's morph. Just take note of the word morph, because we might be coming across it next week. But in very nature, God. It, what Paul is saying is something that is brought out through Jesus, very, very gently, all through his ministry, that is not just the Messiah, but he is more than the Messiah. That is more than the Messiah. And a number of the New Testament writers spell it out. John starts his gospel. In the beginning was the word, dot, dot. And the word was God. In early Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, the writer there talks about Jesus being the image of God. You know, like you'd stamp in a signet ring or making the mark, you know, the impression of Truly and utterly, in the beginning, Jesus is God. He bears the full nature of God. But what Jesus did, verses six, the second half of verse 6 to verse 8. First of all, in the second part of verse 6, he did not count or claim his godly rights. Now we hear a lot today about human rights, animal rights, this right, that right, and all the rest of it. But Jesus did not claim his rights. He could have said, I am part of the eternal Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I don't want to go down there. Do you see what they're up to? What a place. What, what, what? My right, my place is here sharing the eternal glory that I have known from all eternity. But he didn't. He didn't. He could have claimed his natural rights to be powerful and to be a somebody. Because in eternity he was powerful. He was somebody. But rather, he stripped it all off, first part of 7a, he stripped it all off. He said, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to claim my rights. I'm going to lay them all down. They do not matter. And what did he do? He took the form... No, my rights don't matter. So he humbled himself. I'm just going to keep my eye on the text as well. Um, he humbled himself and took the form of a, na of, a, of a servant. And again, it's the same word, morph, nature or form. He was 
found as a servant. And as a servant, rather than being powerful and a somebody, he was effectively vulnerable and a nobody. Okay, yes, he had huge crowds. People took him seriously, a lot of them. But then the majority, in one sense, rejected him and treated him as nothing. And in the end, it was, which is we're coming to in a minute, he had the most ghastly death and was rejected and abused and despised by people. His power meant nothing. He stood before Pilate and power said, Pilate said, don't you know that I've got the power to let you go free or to kill you? He says, the only power you've got is the power you've been given. Oh boy. The only power you've got is the power you've been given to the representative of the most powerful man on earth in those days, Caesar. Well, particularly in that part of the world, which was a huge part of the world. He took the nature of a servant, a slave. The word is interchangeable, slave. And he was our servant, our slave. And what did he do? Well, in the second half of the, oh, sorry, the third part of verse 7 and the first part of verse 8, he said, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. Being made in human likeness. He was human in every way we are, except no male was involved in his conception. He was born of an ordinary woman, conceived by the Holy Spirit, an act of God, of divine intervention, so that we have there, combined in a very marvellous way, manhood and Godhead. The two are combined completely and utterly inseparable. Completely and utterly inseparable. And as a man, he went through what we went through. He went through nine months in the womb. He was born. He learned to walk and talk. And no doubt once he could walk and talk, somebody told him to sit down and shut up. <laughs> isn't that what they do with children? Walk and talk. Aren't, isn't this wonderful? Now sit down, shut up. <laughs> Just slip that one in for a bit of light. But he went through all those things. He learned to trade. Probably some form of builder. Um, we usually say carpenter, but tectone, from which we get architect, is, is, is all to do with building. He was probably an odd job man. He was a man with a donkey rather than a man with a van who would go around and repair this, that and the other. He probably did some woodworking in the shop as well, making crosses, making whatever. Um, but he lived a human life. He went to sleep, he got tired, he got hungry, he ate food. He despaired. He enjoyed parties. He produced abundance of wine when everybody was running out of wine. And used that to show that a little picture that there's something really, really good here in me. But then having taken the form of a nat or nature of a servant, he humbled himself totally and utterly to death. Even death on a cross. Uh, at the end of verse 8 and death on a cross was no joke the Romans perfected it to be painful humiliating scary and it was a weapon of torture a weapon of fear just pause at that and think. That cross, which was a symbol of fear and death, is now worn by millions and millions of people because it's a symbol of hope and life. I just slip that one in again. It's a symbol of hope and life. And we know why. But he humbled himself to death on the cross. Isaiah described it in chapters 52 and 3, second half of 52 and 53. What was happening, what was going on there, or what would happen and what would go on. And nobody expected it, but Jesus. 
Isaiah 52, second half, and 53. And God surprised the world because he, his son, fulfilled that passage on the cross. Totally and utterly. And when it says he appeared in appearance of a man, don't take that to be he wasn't a real man. Some argued in the early centuries of the Christian church that he wasn't really a man and they tried to explain all things away and some do today. He just seemed like but he wasn't really. Yes, he was. And yes, he was God as well. No avoiding it. And he died on that cross. And what did God do? And that's my final heading. What God has done, verses 9 to 11. He has exalted him to the highest place. And in one sense, although he came from the highest place, he goes to the highest place, back to the highest place, with a bit more added to it because of what he did on the cross. Because the, his glory is there in the cross. The victory is there in the cross. Life is going to come because of the cross. And that is his finest hour. The cross. His finest hour. Because no cross, no resurrection. And the cross is where he did it all. He dealt with our sin. He died where we should have died. You and me. He bore our sins in his body. And so when God exalts him to the highest place, which is where in one sense he was before, it's now even higher still, if mixing metaphors a bit or whatever it is, um, higher than ever. And given him what? The name that's above every name. The name that's above every name. This now is a powerful bit that's coming like, I think, a sledgehammer because he's going to be given the name Lord Seigneur but I can refer to the king as our Lord the King whether the French would want to refer to Mr Macron as the Lord President I don't know but we can use the word Lord Seigneur means Sir or Master Lord can mean master. Uh, there are certain parts of England where <coughs> children are taught to call adult males master. Or because it's in the north, it's master. Uh, but actually, the name that's above every name is found in Exodus chapter 3. Because there, when Moses says to the Lord, who's appeared to him in the burning bush... And being told to go to his people and say, I'm going to take you out of Egypt. One of his objections is, well, who shall I say sent me? Who shall I say sent me? When he's being told to go to Pharaoh. With whom he was probably brought up. Because don't forget he was brought up in the Egyptian court, Moses. But does the, say to the people say to him, his own people, the Jewish people, when they say, who sent you? He says, tell them the Lord. Yahweh. You may know it as Jehovah. Y-H-W-H. Nobody's quite sure which vowels go in. But it's normally translated Lord. And that is the name that's above every name. Because that is the personal name of God. Yahweh, as my personal name is Stephen. I know there's other people share my name. Um, some spell it the wrong way, but never mind, I'll forgive them that. But the name of the Lord is Yahweh. And that is the name that's above every name. It's greater than all names. Greater than all people. The sum of all people, because he is the creator of all and all people. And Paul is saying, Jesus fully now is acknowledged as God, as Lord. And there's no escaping it. 
And people who want to say, like the Jehovah's Witnesses do, that jo Jesus is just a God, are barking up the wrong tree. They're heretical. But before that, Paul says, every knee in heaven, on earth and under the earth, everywhere is going to bow and confess with their tongues that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everyone, all 16 billion people, because they reckon as many people have died as have lived. So there's, reckoning now there's about 7 billion people on earth, 8 billion, so there's probably the world population over time is about 16. All 16 billion people are going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Does that mean that all 16 billion people are going to go to heaven? No. Because that is at the second coming. When Jesus returns, everybody will have to acknowledge who he is. People now are free to say what they like about Jesus. They can say he's not God. They can say he didn't exist. They can say that the Bible's made up of fairy tales. They can say exactly what they like. But on that day of judgment, they will have absolutely no choice but to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. No choice whatsoever. The choice is now. But then the other half of the choice is also true, isn't it? That right now we confess Jesus is Lord in repentance of sin, of denying, in acceptance by faith, and to say we're going to live and to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ as our God, our King, and our Saviour. Now is the time. And so if you've never said Jesus is Lord in your heart and on your lips and meant it in repentance and faith, today is the day to do it. Don't leave it. Tomorrow might be too late. But I missed a bit out, didn't I? I missed verse 5 out quite deliberately. Because here we come to my conclusion. Because Paul says, and introduces this wonderful, powerful, sledgehammer passage with these words. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. What he's saying is, these verses that we've just looked at are a pattern for church life, for the church family life, for the people of God. This is a pattern he has laid down for living in relationship with our brothers and sisters. The same attitude, some translate it that way, the same mindset. So I deliberately missed out verses 1 to 4 as well. And again, let's have them read in English and French, please. Well, remember, this is conclusion, so I'm not going to preach on these words. So, well, let's have the French first, please. Uh, en français, premier, s'il te plaît. Oui. Oui. S'il y a donc de l'encouragement en Christ, s'il y a de la consolation dans l'amour, s'il y a une communion de l'esprit, s'il y a de la tendresse et de la compassion, envie ma joie parfaite en vivant en plein accord. Ayez un même amour, un même cœur, une unité de pensée. Ne faites rien par esprit de rivalité ou par désir d'une gloire sans valeur, mais avec humilité, considérez les autres comme supérieurs à vous-même. Que chacun de vous au lieu de regarder à ses propres intérêts, regarde aussi à ceux des autres. And in English, please. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. <clears throat> Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, 
for each of you to the interests of the others. That makes a lot of sense when we've read the last half, verses 5 to 11, doesn't it? And the word humble is there again. We've to humble ourselves as Jesus humbled himself. <clears throat> But oh boy, oh boy, isn't it hard? Because we want to stand on our rights. We want our power. We want our significance. We like to be important now and again. Humble yourself. Humble yourself as Christ humbled himself. Be obedient. Have right relations with one another. But of course, all of this can only happen if something else Paul wrote happens. And we've got to be able to say this because this is how we come to Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I, live, I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, we cannot live the pattern of life that Jesus lived without crucifying self. Because self likes to rule. Self likes to be on the throne. And when we're crucified with Christ, he goes on the throne. So who's on your throne? The throne of your life today. Who's ruling? Who's in charge? In the ups, the downs, everything. And as I said before, if you've never committed to Jesus, do it today. Go to the cross, confess those sins, and accept Jesus. Let us pray. Father, thank you for Jesus, who he is, what he's done, and what he gives. Those of us who have been Christians for many, many years will confess that we don't always live as we should. We let you down. We take the reins. We pretend to be in charge again. Forgive, cleanse, and grant that we may confess again and allow Jesus to be Lord, King of our lives. And may we, in our relationships with each other, humble ourselves and not want to be the top dog. In Jesus' name, Amen.